We're Compound Everything and we talk about money and markets and all things investing. And this week we are talking about Francis Chu. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little about Francis Chu and how, why we're talking about him. So I don't know how this episode came about necessarily, but I think it came across because I stumbled on a, um, a talk by Francis Chu that he gave to the Richard Ivey Business School. And so that's one of the business schools in Canada. So he was giving a speech there. He's actually an investor we follow um, on Dataroma, which is a, a website that follows super investors and value investors and whatnot. And so we just decided to do a little bit of digging and listening to his thoughts and points and whatnot. And that's kind of how it came about. So Francis Chu is uh, actually, he's uh, born in India. Then he was uh, someone who emig immigrated to Canada, I think around the 70s, if I'm not mistaken. And so he became interested in value investing in the late 70s and uh, while he was working at uh, Bell Canada. It's a telephone company. So he's working as a service technician for Bell Canada, became interested in value investing. Now, the interesting thing is he, in 1981, decided to start what's called an investment club. So he started in 1981 and by, I think it was something like 1986, he ended up quitting his job full time at Bell and then ended up managing this portfolio right. mm -hmm. and running this money. Now, the interesting thing about Francis Chu is that his formal education stopped at grade 12. Yes. So he has a grade 12 education. Now, he is a CFA charter holder, which... He went back and got that later, though. I think he went back and got that yeah. later. So when he was... I don't know when, but... Yeah, so when he was proving himself as a value investor and doing really well, yeah. he actually only had it a grade 12. A grade 12 he, he was a self-taught investor, had a grade mm -hmm. 12 education. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of speaks as a testament to the fact that the principles that are taught work and you know and anyone can do and it and anyone can do it so i thought that was a super interesting point about about uh, francis chu mm -hmm. and so one of the things he would say is if you can buy if you can go to the store and if you look for things to buy at a discount you know you want to buy discount fruit i don't know mm -hmm. <laughs> then you have what it takes to be a value investor right so another interesting thing about francis is that he said one of the things that kind of prepared him for value investing was that he came from a large family. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, he was born in India. Yeah. And he was the one who would do a lot of the shopping for the family. Yes. I don't know where he is in the birthing order, but given by that statement, I'm assuming he was maybe on the older yeah. side of things. And so he would go down to the market mm -hmm. where you haggled right. uh, for goods. And so he said you really had to know the pricing and whatnot of what you were buying mm -hmm. for the family. And he learned to find value mm -hmm. in the market because he was buying all the grocery or whatever for his family. Mm -hmm. And so he understood pricing, he yeah. understood mispricing, and he understood the advantage of a mispricing and right. the value in it. So when he came to Canada and he started value investing, he said it kind of came Just, naturally. Cool. And uh, at the end of the lecture that we listened to, he said when everyone was saying, oh, you should go into medicine or do this mm -hmm. or do that because it's good money, he realized that he actually had a competitive advantage in value investing because he was able to do it, it clicked with him, and he was good at it. Yeah. And the rest is history for him. Mm -hmm. So do you have any statistics on the growth of his, like what, what he started with and what he grew it into? Well, I think his, some of the numbers that I've seen are the Chu Associates or whatever. Now he runs like three or four funds. I think he runs four funds actually. And if you, if you Google Francis Chu, you can actually find his funds and it'll actually show you a listing of his holdings mm -hmm. at the time, which is actually kind of interesting. Now, a, just a brief kind of an aside. If you are someone who follows kind of Dataroma and these listing services and whatnot, they'll give you a portfolio mm -hmm. and it'll give you Francis Chu's portfolio, but it's only one of four. Yeah, which and we so, didn't know. Which we didn't know actually, which is interesting. So, you know, do your due diligence if you're going to be following some of these super investors and whatnot. They may have one more, more than one portfolio and they have different holdings. Yeah. And so it's just a, an interesting aside point. Yeah. So, and Dataroma also doesn't mention any shorting. So that's correct. Also something to correct. Keep in mind. And it really doesn't mention bond holdings either. Also and we'll get to that in a minute. In a bit, and Francis Chu is a very much a, a fan of bond holdings. Mm -hmm. of, he's of a bonds. fan of mispricing. He's a, sorry. He's a fan of mispricing. But anyway, we'll get to that a little later. Okay. So initially, I think he started his investment club with. And this is in 1981. He started his investment club with something like, I want to say, ten or fifteen thousand a piece and I think he had okay. five to seven investors okay. so let's call it under a hundred thousand okay. dollars maybe fifty to seventy five thousand he started with I can't remember the exact numbers and then most recently as of 2022 there's a little write-up on him uh, at uh, Richard Ivy Business School it says he now manages well over 650 million okay so that's a lot of that's he did well money he's done well yeah he was right when he said he had he was able to have a competitive advantage yeah. in value investing now here's an interesting aside actually 
he somehow got to know Prem Watson. I'm not sure how this came about. And Prem Watson is also a Canadian investor. Value investor, yeah. Value investor. Prem Watson is often uh, known as the Warren Buffett of Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so he was one of, Francis Chu was one of the first investors with Fairfax. Mm -hmm. And so um, just as, a, as an aside, he, he saw value there. And he actually worked for Fairfax for a while. Yes. And then, I guess, I don't know if he left there or ran the fund on the side. But um, he um, he's very much uh, acquainted with Fairfax uh, Financial as well. So jumping now off of him also knowing Prem, mm -hmm. one thing he mentioned in the video that we watched of him is that he decided that insurance was a really lucrative way to make money. Mm -hmm. And he decided that because both Berkshire yeah. or Warren Buffett uh, and... Fairfax mm -hmm. made a substantial amount of money going into insurance. Yes. So he recently purchased Stone Trust from uh, another value investor who is yes. Monish Pabrai. Yes. Actually, this is another lecture altogether where Monish and, and uh, Francis talk about this transaction and whatnot. And interestingly enough, it sounds like Monish bought it first for his investors and kind of thought he had made a mistake. And I guess he was contacted later on by Francis because he found out somehow through the rumor mill that he was <laughs> trying that that Monish was trying to sell this company. I'm sure and all he, these value investors kind of like run together. Yeah, they all run in the same circle. Yeah. He's he was offended. He's like, why didn't you call me and tell me that you were <laughs> wanting to sell this company? Now, Stone Trust is a workers' compensation yes. um, insurance. Mm -hmm. They do workers' compensation insurance and whatnot. And so, I, I'm not sure what made it unattractive to Monish, but. Uh, Francis thought, yeah, no, I'll buy it. And but it so was attractive to Francis. It was, it was attractive to Francis. I think it had more to do with the day-to-day -day management that Monish really didn't want to get into. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of my assumption on it. Which makes a lot of sense because one of the things he said, he was asked a question. He said, what do you look for in an insurance company? Like, not all insurance companies are created equal. Mm -hmm. You can't just go out and invest in an insurance company. Mm -hmm. And he said the claims department, which right. would definitely be a day-to-day -day portion of the business. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, and he had given some numbers, and I, I'm not very familiar with insurance, but he had given numbers on, you know, how many claims they had open. I just think it was in the hundreds. Yeah, it was. Whereas I it was three, comparable I companies. I 300. Something like that. Yeah, that sounds about right. Whereas, you know, comparable companies, you know, of the same size and same, you know, industry and whatnot would have like in the thousands. So they actually had a pretty good claims department that attracted him to it. And so it was, it was just an interesting little discussion that they had there. Owning an insurance company for a value investor, I think, is a very attractive proposition because, and Warren Buffett has addressed this many times in the past, because of the float. So float is essentially, to my limited understanding, is money you get from premiums. So you get a customer, they pay you premiums, and you get to use that money for free and invest it for a while until a claim is made. And that's why the claims to... department is so important. Yes, because... and risk management. And risk so management. claims and risk management and underwriting. Of, and underwriting become of utmost importance when you have a, an insurance industry like this. And so for a value investor, what Francis said in that video is for their company, for Stone Trust, you had $2 of investable assets for every $1 of capital. Mm -hmm. So I guess it made it very attractive to him. And he could basically juice the returns with this you know, free money. Mm -hmm. And whatnot. On the deal making side, I thought it was interesting to listen to the discussion between Monish and Francis in that uh, they basically made the deal on a handshake. Mm -hmm. So Francis just trusted Monish that he wasn't going to kind of screw him over, and um, the numbers were there. And he said, I, I bought the company, I didn't even visit for four months. So, was this one of the interviews where one of the things you took away was it doesn't matter how good the contract is if you make a deal with a shysty person? Yes, right? precisely. And yeah. they were saying it's so important to make deals with. Trust good people, good people, mm -hmm. trustworthy people, people with integrity, because then the contract almost doesn't matter. Right. But even a very great contract written by excellent lawyers mm -hmm. with a with a terrible person, an untrustworthy still person, not is still, great. it's still not a good deal. Yeah, that yeah. was just a, a quick side note, but that was an interesting point. That was when she said that. Yeah. 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 Well, what, one of the other interesting things I thought about that uh, purchase was that he actually moved the, the domicile of the company. They moved it from being in, I can't remember if it was Kentucky or Louisiana or something. Uh, it was in Louisiana. Right. And then they moved it to Nebraska. Right. And they moved it to Nebraska because of more favorable investing rules. Yeah. Right. Which so, was his second point. When looking for an insurance company, someone said, what do you look for? He said, I look for the claims mm -hmm. people, like the team for the claims because they have to be really on the ball. Yeah. And I look for regulation. Yeah. So I guess Nebraska has more favorable regulation because, well, guess who's there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, that's not it, a surprise. Makes, let's leave the insurance for now because um, that was a small portion. That was a small of portion of it. So, 
One of the things that really struck me with that interview is he emphasized circle of competence. So what does that mean? Because, you know, you hear that frequently. Warren Buffett's talked about it. Now he talks about it. What does that mean? I thought, wow, okay, so let, let's hear his answer. And he said that to develop a circle of competence in an industry or whatnot, he probably would have to spend about six months to a year studying it. And he said and he'd have to continue to study even after that to yeah. keep up with it because yeah. the industry changes. Because things change. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you study the medical field, let's say, then things are constantly changing mm-hmm. there. So you can't, your, your knowledge base can't remain static. I, I thought that was a good point. So it takes six months to a year to really, truly understand something. And he went further even to say that you don't really, really understand it until you've learned about it and then after you've learned about it you've gone through an upturn and a downturn in mm-hmm. that particular sector he's yeah. like then you really understand then you, then it. you really understand it and you understand how it will move and you understand how outside forces and factors will affect that particular industry yeah and he's also a very big proponent of reading obviously it seems like every value investor is just but, every very intelligent person no matter what their specialty is yeah. seems to be a reader yeah well, Charlie Munger has been referred to as a book with legs. Yeah. But I think one of the things that, again, I took home from him was that he said, you, you should probably be reading about 100 pages a day, give or take. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't have to be on the same subject necessarily, but it And probably, it doesn't even need to be a book. Right. It can be an annual report. It could be articles. It could be articles, could be, right. news journals, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And so just to actually truly do, you know delve into that circle of competence, he would say that uh, you've got to be doing a lot of reading you got to spend about 6 to 12 months to understand it. And 100 pages a day. And 100 pages a day. And I can't remember if it was this, this was him or Monish, but one of the things that I took away as well was uh, that you can make money in doing a mile deep dive with an inch wide circle of competence. Yes. And that really struck me because, you know, people are always trying to think broadly, right? Well, they're trying to understand, you know, too many different industries perhaps. But you can make money just, you know, really focusing and narrowing down on one subset of one industry. And he used an example. He used an that. example of a real estate billionaire, actually, who made billions, literally, studying not only real estate in California, but studying real estate in a certain area of Sacramento, California. So very... So very tight niche. Yeah. And so he made a lot of money just studying one specific area of real estate in one specific city mm-hmm. in California. And I always, when you told me that, I was thinking like that probably would be more profitable if you just found an industry and just dug and dug and mm-hmm. dug and you knew you knew everything everything about it instead you of knew more than like, anyone else. I want to know about three or four industries, and I think part of it, at least for me, is that I feel a level. I feel like there'd be more opportunity mm-hmm. if I had if I knew about more. Right. But that opportunity might be risky because I don't know enough. Right. I, right? Well, I'm you a won't... jack of all trades instead of a master of one. Right. How would you know what's mispriced if you don't know right. what the appropriate price is for anything? Right. Then you can't, you can't see mispricings. Whereas if you know pricing, you know, back, like the back of your hand, you can easily spot a mispricing mm-hmm. if it occurs and when it occurs because it inevitably will. Yeah. And what was, that was one of the other things that Francis Chu had said is opportunity doesn't come along all the time necessarily he said four to five he said every four to five years the market will give the value investor a really Mm -hmm. great chance to get in well that's the thing and it might not come into your the area where you feel comfortable necessarily Mm -hmm. so sometimes growth stocks might be on sale Um, sometimes you know maybe bonds will be on sale so how do you tie those two things together in you know so Chu said you have you you need to have a circle of competence you need to be a mile deep but then you're right later on in the interview he said sometimes opportunity comes to you and it's not in your area of expertise Mm -hmm. but I think the way he tied it together and he alluded to this and said a few things is reading Mm -hmm. he's always reading so he knew so much about it and when there's nothing to do Mm -hmm. if you only have opportunity every four to five years that's a lot of years of reading (laughs) that you can do right and so he said he for instance he made a lot of money off oil yes in 2020 and he wasn't studying oil at the time it doesn't sound like it Mm -hmm. but he said i knew a lot about it from before right so he knew it was an opportunity yeah and so i think that's how 
how he does it. How do you take those two statements? You have to be a mile deep. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the market gives you an area where you're not so familiar. Right. The way that you bridge those two comments together is with his other comment of you have to be reading about 100 pages a day. Right. And you will expand your circle of confidence. Yeah. Right. So going back to oil, let's just talk about how he made a killing there. He really did. Yeah. yeah. So one of the ways he did that is actually through buying bonds. Mm -hmm. So he was actually quite favorable towards bond investing and as he opposed wasn't to always. right as opposed to equity investing yeah. um, depending on the circumstance right he said he got into bonds because he realized that was where there was a lot of money to be made a while back mm -hmm. up until that point he was only in equities really and then he started realizing the market doesn't give you what you know about so you better right. learn about what it's so you better you. learn about bonds so he really learned about bonds mm -hmm. and then oil came along and then oil came along and so he made i, I can't remember exactly what uh, the, the amounts were, but Lots. he found bonds trading for like 20 cents on the dollar, mm -hmm. which then later on, you know, matured to, you know, a dollar on the dollar. And that point he sold those bonds. And that didn't include the coupons. And that didn't include the coupons. Some of the coupons had like 9%, 7%. Right. So he's collecting a huge percentage of the yield on each of these bonds until um, the bonds, you know, repriced and went back to, you know, be fully, fully valued. And so the interesting thing about bonds that he said is because they have a senior claim on assets, that's probably the less risky way to go as opposed to buying equity. So in, if, certain, in certain respects. Yeah. So in this case, because the bonds were just so badly beaten down, he found value And the there. oil companies had assets that could the, be sold. And the oil companies had assets that could be sold. So he figured, you know what, if I buy this bond for you know 20 cents on the dollar there's a good chance i'll get my 20 cents back even if it in the event of bankruptcy mm -hmm. but if you're an equity holder in that scenario you're probably not getting anything back yeah. so, and he also said he knew the oil industry he knew the oil so industry. he was pretty sure it wasn't going to go but right. if it did and he worst bought case scenario yes and he bought well-known names yeah i think he bought, i want to say he bought like five or six different uh, companies. Mm -hmm. he, bought, he bought bonds in five or six different yeah. companies. So he did like what he called a shotgun approach. There. Right. He bought five or six different companies in the industry and he calls that his shotgun approach. Right. And so one of the things he said was in the beginning, oftentimes for an investor, when you really don't know very much, you don't have a lot of confidence, it's probably better to take that shotgun approach mm -hmm. and buy, you know, maybe the fifth, five best companies. So let's in say you industry see that's in an being industry. Beaten down. Right. So let's say again, use oil industry for mm -hmm. an example. So buy your five or six best bets there. And chances are, you know, a good four or five of them will work out, even if one of them doesn't. Yeah, and even if only two of them really work out, right. you're going to make far more money back than what you don't make back in yeah. the other three. Yeah. yeah. So he's really favorable as you're inexperienced towards, again, that shotgun approach. The basket to approach. Yeah, the basket approach. Yeah. As opposed to what he calls rifle shooting. Mm -hmm. And so he says as you start to get more comfortable with valuation and valuing stocks and companies Confident and whatnot. In your own Confidence skill. in your own skills and abilities, then you can move on to rifle yeah. shooting later on. I really like that analogy. It was. It was a great analogy. For yeah, sure. and you can see that too. Like Warren Buffett is definitely a rifle shooter, but he's yeah. also one of the best yeah. investors, right? And I know I've heard interviews with other who I would think are like fantastic investors and they're like, why do you have 30, 40, 50 positions? And some a lot of times the comments are, I'm just not comfortable with myself. Right. To only have five. So they still prefer the shotgun approach. approach. Just It probably just keeps you from making a really large mistake. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if one doesn't work out and that's yeah. the one you hold. Yeah. Monish is another one who uses a real oh, rifle approach. He does use a real rifle yeah, approach. He's a really well, funny lady. thing about him, he was asked about portfolio weighting and sizing. And, yeah. And same with Francis, actually, different interview. But they said they typically like to hold a basket of about 10 to 15 stocks. Yeah. So roughly. 10% weighted each, yep. give or take. Although Monish would say that for his personal and family portfolio, he's gone to as few as two or three stocks. I don't even think that I could sleep at night. That'd be tough. If our personal net worth was wrapped up in two stocks. Well, think about it though. I mean, in a sense, you know, if we had, you know, a private business, yeah, you know, okay, and, that's true. And, you know, that was... A lot of people do. They're a lot their, of people do. All their net worth and all their, yeah. you know, everything they have goes into their private business and they sleep quite fine. That's right. Like you, let's say you run a plumbing company. Right. All your assets are there, you right. know, and it's you just got to trust yeah. it. So I guess the point is you really got to know your business because if you, you have, have a business. private business, you really understand your business. Yeah, oh, you you know you'll your leave, cash flows. Yeah, you'll leave no stone unturned. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. 
So he is definitely a value guy. Mm -hmm. He was asked, he it was, someone did say like, you used to be a Ben Graham style, now you're more of a Warren Buffett style. He said, that's not necessarily true. Mm. He said, it's just that I like to go where the valuation is. Right. And he did acknowledge that in a Graham style, you're not gonna get the same return, mm -hmm. but it is a little more certain because you know what the company is worth and mm -hmm. you know what it should get up to and then you sell. Whereas yep. in growth, it's not as certain. So right. with that being said, he made a side comment that was definitely worth taking note of. And he said, when you're running a valuation on a growth company, mm -hmm. you wanna know what you're doing. You yep. wanna get your valuation right. You wanna stick to the facts and mm -hmm. not presumptions. Yep. So once you get all that and you get your intrinsic value, you wanna take 40% off. You right. want a 40% discount. Yeah, you so you wanna buy it for 60 cents on the dollar. Yeah, you are going to the 40% off rack and that is what you are buying. I love the 40% off yeah. rack. Yeah. I like the 50% off rack even better. <laughs> Me too. So that was interesting because anytime a really experienced investor mm -hmm. says things like that, I wanna take note of it because that's how they don't always come out and say this is exactly what I do because then they're giving away their edge. Their, right, they're giving mm -hmm. away their edge to the world, right? But when you listen to a lot of interviews, they'll just say things in passing. And if you can catch it, you can put a lot together oh, and for kind sure of figure you can. out their method. So I you caught that mm -hmm. and then I caught it again later. And another thing that he had mentioned with growth companies is that he is willing to buy a company that's growing mm -hmm. at 10%. Yes. And he looks five years into the future. So he looks 10 years into the past. Mm -hmm. And then he says, I like to know where they're gonna be or project five years into the future. So those were also two numbers that I took yep. note of. But he said if he can find a company that's growing at 10% or more, mm -hmm. he's comfortable paying an earnings multiple of 14, 15, 16. Right. And then he said, I would never want to pay a multiple of over 30, which was very intriguing because Lee Lu said, mm -hmm. you will not find good companies for under 30. So that's another thing. You got to take all of these people and kind of come up and with your own. synthesize them together. Yeah. The funny part is actually though, as of recently, he was he was actually holding Apple in his Chew portfolio. Chu or Lilu? Uh, Chu. Okay. Uh, Francis Chu was holding Apple in his portfolio. Mm -hmm. And he had talked about that and he said, yeah, it just mm -hmm. came on a reasonable deal. I think he yeah. said it, he got it for like you know, 16 times earnings or something yeah. like that. Google and too. He also he also also holding Google. So these he said things he got do Google happen. Google on fifteen times earnings. Yeah. he says worked out wonderfully for him. Yeah, so obviously you, you just have to wait. Yeah. You just have to be patient as an investor and not yeah. overpay. Yeah, because overpaying is probably the cardinal sin yeah. in, in in value investing. And that was one thing he kept talking about: value, value, yeah. circle of competence, value. Yeah. be ready for what it gives you. Mm -hmm. uh, those were kind of my main takeaways. Yeah. So, is there anything other big points that you took away from? Francis Chu and our study of him. One of the biggest takeaways I, I took was his hunting for forty percent discounts. Mm -hmm. Basically, he wants to buy things for, you know, sixty percent of what they're worth, mm -hmm. or or better, mm -hmm. right, or less. And so, when you do that, um, you're going to find a range of values, right? And one of the things that he would say is, you know, don't just buy it toward the, you know, the low end of range. You want to buy it like even beneath mm -hmm. that. And so I thought that was that was interesting. And the other thing was portfolio sizing and position mm -hmm. sizing. So he would say that you know he's comfortable with about ten to fifteen positions, making roughly you know ten percent or a little less, eight seven percent of the portfolio weighting into any one stock, which yeah. I thought was interesting. That is an interesting yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the last thing I, that really hit home was the fact that he his formal education stopped at grade twelve. Yeah. I thought that was just That's, so awesome. I mean, yeah. he's obviously an intelligent guy and very capable because he went on later to get a CFA. Mm -hmm. But the point being is you can invest on your own. Mm -hmm. You can do this, you know, He and he's living proof that you can do it and actually be very good at it. Very good at yeah. it, yeah. So I think maybe to end is by a quote. So he said 99% of the time for the value investor, you're just waiting and watching. Mm -hmm. But when that 1% comes where the market gives you an opportunity, you have to be ready yes. and you have to act quick. Yes. So again, that 100 pages of reading. Right. And so you can only act quick if you are prepared. Mm -hmm. and, and have cash. And have cash. Oh, he did talk about that. He did talk about that. Yeah. That's one little aside. Before yeah, he, he, did, he did say that it's good to have cash on hand for when those opportunities yeah. come. So that when that, that little moment of time comes where the market just throws you it throws you that fat pitch that fat pitch you have cash ready to deploy yeah and i think warren buffett talks about the pink elephant yeah he wants yeah. the elephant gun ready and loaded so that when that pink yeah. elephant comes he can take it down he can take it down yeah. so i think we'll end there is yeah. there anything else you wanted to add no i think that's a very good summary um, obviously you can google francis chu and find his videos on youtube and other information from him i think he writes a letter 
oh, he does write a letter for his uh, fund holders, and it's actually very good. So yeah. th required reading. Definitely. Requ you can add it to your 100 pages a day. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Yeah. So if you can like and subscribe this video, it really helps our channel, and we will see you next time.